In covering true crime here on YouTube, I have been asked to make videos on thousands of cases. Every day, my brother and I go through the dreading official email and respond to emails, looking into crimes, and starting to research the ins and outs of whatever story was sent our way. There have been a number of times where we are sent cases that technically don't exist. Usually, these examples involve a few key factors. A person going missing or dies, seemingly of their own volition. Maybe they left some form of communication, like a note or a video, stating their intention and they don't want to worry their family. Their communication is almost always scant and not particularly emotionally satisfying to those who know them. Maybe they only left a few words. Maybe they didn't sound like they were in the right mind in their recording. Whatever the case, the message that was left makes their friends and family think that something is being covered up. Following their disappearance or death, a large-scale effort is made to uncover the truth, usually solely involving friends and family. When they are spoken to by media outlets and police, the people who knows them emphasize how doing anything like this is deeply out of the person's character. Statements like, something has to be wrong, because he would never put us through something like this, are repeated over and over again by various people who knew the person. It becomes almost a mantra. We know something is wrong because they would never. And yet, after a brief investigation, law enforcement states simply, there is nothing to be done. Sometimes, they simply take the scene for what it is, not considering any other possibilities. But other times, they heavily investigate, go through a person's social media, and find an abundance of evidence that the person did leave on their own, or harmed themselves. And that, as devastating as it is, is when they close the case. Oftentimes, the family will fight against this narrative, and usually state that the investigation was botched, which, in many cases, it will be. They will argue that their child, sister, brother, father, or mother is being left behind by the justice system, and will rally whoever they can on social media to help bring attention to the case as much as possible, even in the face of direct, unflinching evidence that whatever happened was either done by the person knowingly, or an accident. In either case, hoping beyond reason that they can make sense of their death. But no matter how much public attention is raised, or if the case is reopened, these stories tend to have the same result. That being, the case is closed a second, third, or maybe fourth time, with nothing being done. And while that seemed like it was going to be the case when we began our research in June, that is far from it. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading. Or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today we are going to be covering the case of Alicia Navarro a 14-year-old girl who vanished in the middle of the night four years ago, leaving only a cryptic note for her family to find, which has been recently resurfaced. The details of this case are incredibly murky, as key details have yet to be publicized. But we were already working on a video on Alicia's disappearance when she rematerialized states away from where she went missing. This case is extremely odd, very technically, with no crime being committed. But looking into the details, it becomes clear that something is definitely amiss. I want to be clear before going any further, as of time of writing, no crime was committed. I'm not accusing any person mentioned in this video of a crime. I will simply be laying out the facts of the case, as I have compiled them from various sources. I also ask you to not go and contact anyone involved in this case on social media. I know that the vast majority of you do not need that to be specified, but if you have an opinion you would like to share with this case, please do it here on this channel, rather than seeking another party out. This story has come highly recommended by our subscribers, like the vast majority of our videos. If there's a video you would like to see featured on our channel, or a story you would like to bring more attention to, email me at dreading.official at gmail.com. We are constantly going through our email submissions, responding and adding your suggestions daily. With all of that said, let us begin. This video is brought to you by Factor. This past month, my brother and I have been trying to up our production time. That way we can produce better quality videos. This means investing in better equipment, working with other people behind the scenes to fact check our research, and working around the clock to make videos that are both factual and respectful to all parties involved. But that doesn't leave a whole lot of time for thoughtful, healthy meals. But thankfully, Factor has helped us a lot in that department. Factor makes meeting your nutrition goals easier than ever by delivering fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. Our team of gourmet chefs create each meal using only ingredients with integrity to help you feel your best all day long. With Factor, we've been able to skip going to the grocery store altogether and not have to worry about prep and cooking time. And we've avoided the hassle of all the cleanup. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat and enjoy. Then, get back to making FOIA requests and researching. They also have plenty of options, so even the pickiest eaters can find what they're looking for. Choose from 34-plus, weekly, flavor-packed, fresh, never-frozen meals, ready to eat in two minutes. 
Factor also offers Gourmet Plus meals as part of your weekly options, which means you can get a little gourmet with your meal plan whenever you're craving something special. If you're like me and are a bit too busy to cook your own meals, but want to continue making healthy choices and reaching your goals, then head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code DREADING50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Again, that's DREADING50 for 50% off. Now is the perfect time to try Factor. Thank you again to Factor for sponsoring us over here at Dreading and to everyone who allows us to get sponsors. With all of that said, let us begin. Alicia Christian Navarro was born on September 20th, 2004, and grew up in Glendale, Arizona, a suburban community just west of Phoenix. Growing up, Alicia struggled with various sensory issues and often chose to spend time alone. According to her mother, Jessica Nunez, Alicia was extremely dependent on her and needed to have a strict routine in order to feel at ease. At first, Jessica believed her daughter was just a bit particular, but after talking to many professionals, Alicia was formally diagnosed with autism at the age of 12. This manifested in her wearing some of the same clothes every day, particularly a large oversized sweatshirt, and eating only certain foods, like McDonald's chicken nuggets and croissants from Starbucks. Her special interests included reading and playing video games online, Minecraft in particular, and she would often lose time playing alone in her room. At age 11, she began using Discord to talk to people online about Minecraft, and quickly found a community. Those closest to her stated that she found it easier to open up to her friends online through a screen, and a lot of the anxiety she felt from social interactions dissipated when she was on Discord. She had a relatively small group of friends in real life, but hated going out to meet them, instead choosing to spend the majority of her time at home in her room, where she could be in control. Though Alicia excelled academically and enjoyed learning, school and the social interactions associated with school posed a challenge for the young girl. She had changed schools numerous times, and at one point had done online learning, as she felt it made it a bit easier for her to focus. But in 2019, when Alicia was 14 years old, she would begin going to Burgade Catholic High School. And immediately, things would begin to change. Jessica noted that her normally introverted, shy daughter began to express interest in things that Jessica found were out of the ordinary. She started talking about comic books regularly and became obsessed with makeup. Alicia began asking to go out by herself more and more and would wear what her mother would describe as uncharacteristically provocative clothing when she did so. She also became interested in fitness, talking about how she wanted to change her appearance and present herself in a certain way. The quick change was alarming for Jessica, but she chalked it up to her daughter wanting to fit in at school, and a normal part of puberty. Two weeks before Alicia went missing, she asked her mom to drop her off at a local mall to hang out with two friends. The two friends were a few years older than she was, but she had known them since she was in kindergarten. Jessica agreed, allowing her to go to the mall for two hours, before promptly picking her up. Shortly after the trip to the mall, Alicia would send a message on Discord to one of her friends, 20-year-old Clark Samples. The message is stated that she had recently sold her Xbox, which was one of her most prized possessions, and that she, quote, had a boyfriend now, end quote. Clark and Alicia were friends on Discord, having met in a community related to Minecraft. The group included people of all ages, and when asked about the age difference between him and Alicia, Clark would state that he was aware, however their friendship was strictly platonic. He went further to state that the group on Discord was well aware of Alicia's age and her autism, and that they would, quote, try to build Alicia's confidence up so that she could make some friends in real life, unquote. He would supplement his statements by saying that he never noticed anything inappropriate happening in the Discord groups that he was a part of. However, in at least one instance, Jessica became aware of her daughter posting her private information online. Details on this occasion vary source to source, with some articles stating that Alicia posted her address in a Discord group, with others saying she posted her address on Facebook. But regardless, When her mother became aware of the post, she talked to Alicia about online privacy and how she should be mindful not to provide her information to anyone she doesn't know. On Friday, September 13th, 2019, Alicia stayed home from school as she felt anxious and overwhelmed. Despite her anxiety, Jessica and Alicia spent the day together, going up to McDonald's for some chicken nuggets and getting their eyebrows threaded before hitting up a small chocolate shop on the way home. After a couple of hours outside, Alicia spent the rest of the day in her room, playing games online. The day was fun, according to Jessica, who cited that her daughter was excited and happy for her birthday coming up. The next day, Alicia's mood seemed to change. She spent all day in her room, interacting with her family minimally. Around 1am the next morning, 
Alicia left her room to get a glass of water from the kitchen, and she was shocked to see her mother still awake. Alicia asked what her mom was doing up so late, and the two talked for a short while before getting her water and leaving. The interaction was supposedly incredibly normal and nice, but little did Jessica know that would be the last time she would see her daughter. The next morning, Jessica woke up around 7 a.m. and began her morning routine. However, when she left her bedroom, she immediately noticed something was amiss. The back door of the home was left wide open. Chairs had been placed against the brick wall in the backyard, and there were small shoe prints leading away from the home. Jessica's mind began to race, and she quickly ran to her daughter's room, fearing the worst. The room was empty, but there was a small note waiting for Jessica on her desk. It read, I ran away, I'll be back, I swear, I'm sorry. Jessica immediately called the police. As she waited for the police to arrive, she looked around Alicia's room for any clues to where her daughter might be, only to find that Alicia wasn't the only thing missing. It appeared she had taken her small black backpack, as well as some body spray, makeup, multiple comic books, as well as her phone and MacBook computer. Notably, her chargers for both things were still in her room. When the police arrived on the scene, it was clear what had happened. Sometime after their conversation in the kitchen, Alicia had waited for her parents to go to sleep, before grabbing her things and sneaking out of the back. The footprints indicated she had done this all by herself, without anyone else being present. But, given her age, it was unlikely that she had gone far. They found footprints on the other side of the brick wall, leading toward the street. Jessica immediately began posting about the disappearance, and she asked all who knew Alicia to reach out and contact her to try and convince her to come home, but nothing came of their pleas. The police also discovered a small hole had been cut through Alicia's window screen. The hole was about the size of a fist, and appeared to have been cut from the inside. Jessica stated that she was aware of this hole, as it had appeared in the past month, and claimed when she asked Alicia about it, her daughter falsely alleged a small bird had flown into the window. Jessica believed she had no reason to distrust what her daughter was saying, but with her daughter missing, she now feared the worst. Why had Alicia cut a hole in the screen? Had someone convinced her to do it? And if so, why? Investigators talked to the other people who had recently spent time with Alicia before the disappearance, and according to the two boys she had gone to the mall with two weeks prior, Alicia had a second phone on her person and was actively talking to someone else the whole time they were together. Both boys described the phone and the fact that Alicia kept it in the front pocket of her small black backpack but Jessica claimed that this couldn't be possible, as when she dropped Alicia off and picked her up, she didn't have her backpack with her. Similarly, three days before Alicia disappeared, she messaged one of her friends and told him she was thinking about running away from home. She didn't provide any reason as to why she wanted to leave, or as far as I have found in the reporting, she didn't elaborate on why, but she said she was interested in moving to California, and she invited her friend to join her. He declined, believing she wasn't serious about her leaving home. Police would try to ping Alicia's phone and computer to try and find her, but it seemed that her electronics had been turned off or destroyed. Initially, Glendale police issued a digital billboard on Loop 101 to draw attention to the missing girl, but no leads came of it. The evidence that the police found within the first couple of hours all pointed to Alicia voluntarily running away, and while the police continued to search for her, their efforts were not as strong as they would have been if they believed she was abducted. Jessica stated that multiple officers told her husband and her that Alicia would likely turn up in a day or two, and just waited out. Four days after her disappearance, the day prior to Alicia's birthday, a friend of the Navarro family stated that she had seen Alicia the day before at a local park. The park had a significant homeless population residing within it, and it seemed likely that if Alicia was on her own, she would end up there. Jessica went to the park and spoke to multiple men and women, showing them pictures of Alicia and asking if they had seen her in the past five days. Allegedly, multiple people confirmed the witness's story and stated that they had seen a girl matching Alicia's description there the day before, walking with an African-American man who had facial, hand, and neck tattoos. Months later, a man fitting this description would be found and arrested as part of a sting operation targeting child sex criminals, but he claimed not to know who Alicia was. On Alicia's birthday, Jessica hoped beyond reason that her daughter would come back home. The police told her that given all the evidence, her daughter had left by herself and would likely find her way back. Given her excitement for her 15th birthday and the red velvet cake, Jessica felt that if Alicia was able to come back home, she would have. But the day came and went without any updates. 
Alicia's family knew that the police weren't prioritizing her case. As they stated, she was just a runaway, so they took multiple matters into their own hands. Jessica rallied those around her and made it her mission to keep her daughter's name in the news. She lambasted the police for not taking her daughter's disappearance seriously and detailed how Alicia needed routine therapy and her medications to get through the day, and without those things, she knew her daughter was a higher risk. For the first year, Jessica would go out looking for her daughter nightly, and she was shocked at what she found. She told the Arizona Central paper, quote, At the beginning, there would be tips, and I would go out at night looking for her. That's when I found out what the nightlife out here looks like. I saw these kids on drugs, prostitutes, and all that. There were nights that I couldn't sleep after looking for her. Nearly a year after she went missing, the Glendale Police Department would put out a silver alert for the young girl, but like their efforts before, nothing came of it. For four years, Jessica worked on her daughter's case, raising funds to buy billboards across the United States and make sure her daughter's name stayed in public consciousness. She worked with YouTubers, podcasters, and other crime media and created her own TikTok page dedicated to talking about her daughter. Jessica worked with police and private detectives, and they all came to the same conclusion, that being the fact that her daughter had likely been lured away from the home by a predator on social media, specifically Discord. The predator had likely coached her in the weeks prior to her disappearance, giving her a burner phone to avoid detection, and telling her to bring her phone and computers so their messages couldn't be found and they could avoid detection. The likelihood that Alicia would be found, especially unharmed, was small, but Jessica continued to persevere, hoping that her daughter was safe from harm, and nearly four years later, that dream would come true. On July 23, 2023, Four years after she had disappeared from her family home, Alicia walked into the Haver Police Department in Montana and asked to be taken off the missing persons list. Good afternoon. My name is Jose Santiago. I'm the media manager here at the Glendale Police Department. Uh, We want to first start off by telling you all thank you for your coverage on this announcement today. It is a major announcement for us here at the Glendale Police Department. Um, I want to start off by saying that there's a lot of mixed emotions with this particular announcement that we're having. We are happy, and at the same time, we're hopeful that we will be able to supply this family a little bit more closure. With that, I would like to tell you that Alicia Navarro has been located. She is, by all accounts, safe. She is, by all accounts, healthy. And she is, by all accounts, happy. She was located in a very small town in Montana near the Canadian border. Uh, We can tell you that she went to a local police department in that area. She identified herself as Alicia Navarro. And at that point, our officers went into investigation mode. Uh, We conducted several types of interviews. And not only through those interviews, but through the help of Alicia's family themselves, we are confident that the person that we are talking with and are dealing with is indeed Alicia Navarro. Um, I can't even begin to express to you all the pride that I personally have in the men and women here at our police department. Since her discovery, our men and women here have been working tirelessly around the clock to not only bring closure to this family, but to make sure that Alicia gets everything that she possibly needs. I'm also going to bring up Lieutenant Scott Waite. It's his team that has been leading this investigation. He will have a few words. Thank you, Jose. Again, Lieutenant Scott Waite, Glendale Police Department. Um, I don't think you could put enough words in the the joy that we feel um, knowing earlier this week when we received a call that Alicia Navarro um, had identified herself to police officers in Montana. Um, Not only the relief and joy for us, for Alicia, for her family, and for our community. Um, There hasn't been, I think anybody that hasn't known this investigation that hasn't put themselves in the same spot as Alicia, her family, and the emotions that they must be going through, not only back in 2019 when this occurred, um, but in the last few days. With that, We want you to know that we are continuing to investigate. We immediately responded to the area, and with the help of uh, the United States Marshal Service, as well as the FBI, uh, we've been able to continue this investigation 
to make contact with Alicia, to reunite her with her family, and only begin to put together the puzzle, which is her disappearance and her returning. I would ask patience, not only for us as law enforcement in this investigation, but patience for Alicia and for her family. We can only imagine what she's going through mentally, emotionally, as well as her family. And as much as we'd like to, to say this is the end, we know this is probably only the beginning of where this investigation will go and that we will continue to work with our state, local, federal partners, and even across state lines to make sure that Alicia has everything that she needs, um, that she's taken care of, that her family is getting the help that they need, and that most importantly, that this investigation is completed thoroughly and done correctly. The press conference about Alicia being found revealed very few details about her reappearance, and many questions are still unanswered. According to the New York Post, after Alicia spoke to the police on the 23rd, she then spoke with her mother on the phone. Both parties were crying, and she apologized to her mother and assured her that she was okay. Jessica then posted this video. Hello everybody, hola a todos. Al final voy a hacer este video en español. At the end I will do this video in Spanish. I do feel I owe this video to the community and to God. Because I first of all want to give glory to God for answering your prayers and for this miracle. For everyone who has missing loved ones, I want you to use this case as an example. That miracles do exist and never lose hope and always fight. My daughter, Alicia Navarro, was missing since September 15, 2019. She has been found safe. I do not know the details. I do confirm that she is my daughter, she is alive, and she is safe. This is recent news for me. It was an hour before it was posted in social media and the news. I don't have details, but the important thing is that she is alive. And I want to thank the community and God for all that you have done. Hola a todos. Quiero hacer este video para primeramente darle gracias y gloria a Dios por escuchar nuestras oraciones. Y también quiero agradecer al público por todo el apoyo infinito que me han dado. Todas las personas que tienen familiares o amistades desaparecidas, quiero que usen mi caso como un testimonio que milagros y las oraciones, sí, los milagros sí existen y las oraciones sí se escuchan. No quiero que se den nunca por vencidos. Mi hija Alicia Navarro, que, está desas, que estaba desas, desaparecida desde septiembre 15 del año 2009, ha sido encontrada sana y salva. No puedo dar detalles, acaba de darme esta noticia hace poco y quiero agradecer a todos por todo el apoyo. Muchas gracias. Alicia claimed to have run away on her own, but as for where she was living within the first few years of her disappearance, that is still unknown. However, for the past two years, Alicia had reportedly been living with her boyfriend, 36-year-old Eddie Davis. According to neighbors, they had been together for at least a year, and they had seen Alicia around his apartment frequently. Eddie Davis was a Montana resident for his entire life, and according to his Facebook, worked at a local Walmart in town before getting fired. No information is known about how the two met, but according to friends, neighbors, and witnesses who have seen them together throughout the past year, Navarro has always seemed happy to be in his company, and the couple never raised suspicion. Because Navarro was now an adult, she doesn't have to comply with the investigation into her abduction, and as far as the police had told the public, she is adamant that she ran away of her own volition. She has chosen to stay in Montana and has not returned or attempted to see her family, past the one FaceTime call she reportedly made to her mother. But many feel as though this case is not over, or at the very least, that Alicia is not safe. And while this case doesn't feel like it's truly over, as long as Alicia herself is stating that she is safe, nothing more can be done. Again, I urge you to leave any comments about this case in the comment section down below, and to not seek out anyone involved. Let me know your opinion on what occurred here, or if you would like to see another case on this channel, let me know in the comments down below. I hope you have a great day, and remember to stay safe.